entire team at BPB Publications for actually arranging this event and allowing me to be here today. And also a huge thank you to the staff and the students here at Amity University for putting, to, for, for, for putting this together and actually uh, coming today. Again, this is a really exciting event. As I mentioned, the reason that I'm here is because, again, I am actually really uh, coming today. Again, this is a really technology. In fact, as we speak, this machine learning technology is impacting hundreds of fields and hundreds of thousands of lives across the globe. You've probably all used machine learning technology today without even realizing it. It could be something simple, like for example, even just taking a look at your wrist and saying, hey Siri, what's the weather going to be like today? You'll figure out what the weather's going to be like. And even the prediction of the forecast for the weather is powered by machine learning if you're using a data source like the weather company. It could be something like opening up Netflix and watching a movie. As you do that, Netflix is learning what kinds of movies you like, what kinds of TV shows you like, and even down to the actual pictures and the covers of the movies that it shows you, that's all powered by machine learning technology. Or it could be something like sending an SMS or an email and using the quick type predictions on your keyboard. All of that is powered by machine learning. Sometimes you don't even realize it, but your experience is being made better by machine learning technology, and you don't need to play an active role in doing so. As I mentioned, this machine learning technology is impacting every field that uses technology in some way or another. Healthcare is the one that I'm most passionate about, which is why I'm working on numerous different projects, including a project that actually lets me track a lot of different data that teens, the youth generate on their mobile devices in order to actually figure out small patterns that may hint towards depression in the future, to diagnose depression before it plays a critical role in someone's life. I'm also working towards technology that enables me to provide a kind of artificial communication ability to those who cannot communicate naturally by understanding their electroencephalogram brainwaves through custom machine learning algorithms that I develop. I've also worked on a project that enables audiologists to diagnose hearing disorders in much faster ways than they could do without machine learning technology. And I'm also working on a project that enables clinical researchers to actually predict adverse events that patients may experience to drugs even before they take the drug. And that's even if that specific patient's genotype or demographic was never tested against that specific chemical composition of drug ever before. The possibilities with machine learning truly are endless, which is why I'm working on numerous different projects here. But before I get even deeper into machine learning technology and what I'm doing with it today and how it's impacting our lives, I'd like to start off at the very beginning. But to do that, we have to travel back in time by around nine years to when I was five years old and I originally started programming. You see, when I was five years old, my dad used to work as a computer programmer. And as you can imagine, as a curious five-year-old trying to figure out pretty much everything about what's around me, computers would really intrigue me. Because really just watching them do anything, whether it be displaying my name on the screen or even something as simple as adding two numbers, it would be like magic to me. I wanted to figure out how that worked. And so my dad saw that curiosity that I had and introduced me to the world of computers and programming. My first few programs were written in simple languages like Fox Pro and Batch, but my curiosity only grew from there. And I started to work with numerous other languages. I started to use the internet and different books as more le learning resources. In fact, when I was seven years old, a pretty interesting story is that um, uh, this was around grade three. And I had a test coming up in school, but the thing is I wasn't really good at my times tables. So what I did was I created a pretty simple Windows application to help me practice my times tables by asking me random questions. And it worked. I actually got a good score on the test because of that application that I created. And so I decided a year later, why not make that accessible to more people? And so when I was nine years old, I submitted my very first iOS application, T-Tables, to the iOS App Store. And on Valentine's Day of 2013, it was accepted onto the iOS App Store. That was my very first sort of iPhone or real application. From there, I continued to work with technology. Uh, when I was 10 years old, I started my YouTube channel called Tanmay Teaches. And the subjects that I love to post on this, to, on this channel range all the way from iOS app development to math and science, programming, 
and algorithms in general. But whenever I would upload a video, I would always realize that no matter when it is, uh, there are always, every single time I upload a video, tens or hundreds of people reaching out to me to, through comments, through emails, through tweets, asking me questions like, how can I get into programming? How can I implement this algorithm in my applications? How can I use machine learning technology? And I realized one thing, and that is that there is a lack of resources out there. It's a really steep learning curve for any beginner that wants to get into technology and any beginner that wants to get into specifically programming with new and advanced technology. And that's why I initiated my goal to help and reach out to at least 100,000 aspiring beginners to help them innovate along their journey of learning to code. I'm really glad to say that so far, I've been able to reach the 8,800 mark, and I'm always working towards it through numerous different media. Of course, there's my YouTube channel, there are the books that I author, the blogs that I write, but also the talks and the workshops that I conduct at schools and universities across the globe, the keynotes that I have at conferences, essentially trying to take whatever I learn about machine learning technology and make it accessible to more and more people so they can use that technology as well. Because machine learning is powerful, but it's important to have people that actually understand how to implement that technology before it can truly be made useful. In fact, speaking of speaking the computer's language and, and making machine learning technology useful, another reason that I absolutely love taking whatever I learn about computers and making it accessible to more people is because, well, in the future, this is going to be a necessity. In fact, Mark Anderson says that in the future, there are only going to be two types of jobs, those in which computers tell humans what to do and those in which humans tell computers what to do. So if you want to be on the other end of the spectrum telling the computers what to do, you've got to make sure that you know how to speak their language. You need to make sure that you can speak their language and you can actually tell the computer, you can instruct it as to what you want it to do so you can make that technology truly useful. And that's why I'm working towards the goal that I have to reach out to 100,000 aspiring beginners. Of course, from here, I continue to upload to my YouTube channel. I continued to work towards sharing my knowledge about all the different technology that I'd learn about. But I always felt something was missing, especially when I was around 10, 11 years old. I felt like technology was missing something. It wasn't really as interesting to me as it was just a few years ago. And I realized that the reason for that was because technology is very literal. It's very rigid. You code something in and it never changes. It, it starts becoming obsolete the moment you're done implementing it. And so I started to slowly lose my interest in technology. But one day, out of, com out of a complete coincidence, I was uploading a video to my YouTube channel and I stumbled upon a documentary. A documentary of IBM Watson playing and winning the Jeopardy game show against the two best human competitors on the game show, Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter. Now, I'm sure you've heard of Watson playing Jeopardy. And if you have, you know that this is a big feat for a computer to accomplish. Now, the reason this is so complex is because Jeopardy isn't your average game show. They're not asking you questions. In Jeopardy, you're given statements and you have to create the questions yourselves. These statements are called clues and they are very complex. By complex, I mean they're filled with wordplay, riddles, puns, that even the greatest humans sometimes have a hard time understanding. What you see on screen is just the average Jeopardy clue. And this is one that even some of the best humans have a hard time understanding, forget actually answering from there. But seven years ago, back in 2011, IBM Watson was able to not only understand those Jeopardy clues, Watson was actually able to correlate that with natural language information that it had stored on its drives, and it was able to create questions to the clues that it was given in Jeopardy format natural language. In fact, for the clue that I had just shown you on screen, Watson answered, who is Dertognan, as the correct answer in a real game against Ken and Brad. And the best part is that Watson did this in under three seconds. Watson did this in 2.6 seconds, to be precise, and won the match. But before I get even deeper into what I'm doing with IBM Watson, I think it's important to start and understand 
what exactly Watson, or what goes behind it, machine learning technology truly is. I know I use a lot of terminology, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and so much more, but what really does that mean? And well, machine learning might sound complex, machine learning might look complex, but it's actually really simple. It's basically just a set of mathematical operations that you use to build a model. And that model can then transform new data into predictions. What that means is that instead of programmers sitting there and typing out conditions to everything that could possibly uh, be inside of a data set to understand data, now the computer can write out really complex conditions for us. We just provided example data and a good architecture, and it automatically figures that all out for us, which is really useful when you're teaching a computer to do something like understand natural language or figure out what's in a certain image. But wait, what is artificial intelligence then? That's machine learning technology. But there's another term that you've probably heard much more than machine learning, and that is artificial intelligence. And well. Even though you've probably heard about artificial intelligence a lot, you've heard about AI technology, I'm really sorry to break it to you, but artificial intelligence, which is essentially taking the human mind and simulating that inside of a computer, does not exist. It's not a thing, because artificial intelligence is simply not possible. You cannot, currently, with the architecture of computers that we have right now, you cannot simulate a person's mind or even the basic algorithms that go behind it inside of a computer, which is essentially just a really fast and really precise calculator. Rather, what exists are two separate types of algorithms, rule-based systems and machine learning systems. A lot of people like to categorize this as AI, but it's not. These are not artificial intelligence systems. But I would love to give you a quick example of these systems. Let's start off with rule-based systems. Now, of course, you've all heard of the chess board game. Many decades ago, it was impossible for a computer to play chess. But IBM's Deep Blue computer was the first computer to beat a chess grandmaster at the game of chess. Now, this was a huge feat for computers many, many years ago. But nowadays, you can play chess against your own phone in your pocket or maybe even on your Apple Watch. So why was this so important? Well, a lot of people like to think of Deep Blue or a chess playing machine as artificial intelligence. But it's not intelligent. The computer doesn't understand how to play chess at all. What the computer is doing is actually really, really simple. It's saying, all right, this is the current chess board. For this board, what are all the moves that I could make according to the rules of chess? Then, for all of those moves, what are all the possible moves that my opponent could make? Then, for every single one of those moves, what are all the moves that I could make? And it would do that over and over and over again until it has hundreds of millions of possible outcomes for the game. And then, it just chooses the branch that has the highest likelihood of winning and the lowest likelihood of losing. It's really, really simple. It's just an algorithm. It's not intelligent in any way whatsoever. It doesn't even learn how to play the game of chess. But it plays better than humans because it's able to look through hundreds of millions of games that humans never could. But more recently, there was another advancement in machine learning technology specifically. And I'm sure you've heard of it. It's by Google, their startup called DeepMind. And it's called AlphaGo, or AlphaGo Zero. AlphaGo is able to play the Go board game much better than any human ever could. Now, why is that complex? Chess is a board game, Go is a board game. You could do the exact same thing. Just look at all the different possibilities. But that doesn't work, because with chess, you've got hundreds of millions of possible outcomes. With the game of Go, though, you're dealing with more possible outcomes then there are atoms in the universe. So you're dealing with a lot more board states here. It's a really complex game. And of course, it's a game that originated around 4,000 years ago in China. So this game is really complex. And when AlphaGo was released, experts thought a, a perfect Go AI or perfect Go playing machine was at least 10 years ahead of its time. And that's what AlphaGo does. It uses machine learning to actually play against itself to learn how to play the game of 
Go. Humans don't need to teach it how to play Go. It spends just one week playing it, and it's able to use its intense mathematical operation power in order to gather, quite literally, centuries of experience that a human could never practically gather. But what's so interesting about machine learning technology compared to rule-based systems is that machine learning technology, in a way, behaves a little bit like an intelligent sort of natural human would. What I mean by that is that when, for example, Garry Kasparov played against Deep Blue, he noted that Deep Blue felt a lot like a computer. Deep Blue, you could tell that it wasn't a human because there wasn't any immediate strategy or tactics behind what Deep Blue was playing. It was just playing the mathematically perfect move. But with AlphaGo, Lee Sedol, the, champion, the world champion at the game of Go that played against AlphaGo, he noted that AlphaGo felt just like another human player. AlphaGo felt just like another human applying the same kind of strategy or tactics that one would. It's just that this was a really, really experienced human. Sometimes AlphaGo would make a move that apparently didn't make sense to some people, or at least to most Go experts. But it turns out towards the end of the game, that's the one move that didn't make sense to a human that allowed AlphaGo to win. Because again, AlphaGo gathered those centuries of experience that a human simply never would have been able to. And these machine learning systems aren't even just one set of algorithms. There are tons of different machine learning algorithms for tons of different use cases. The one that I'm most interested in is a branch called deep learning that enables computers to learn, again, in a more natural and organic way. And these are the two algorithms, rule-based systems and machine learning systems, that are meant to work towards building AI. But whether or not we'll ever get there is highly questionable, to say the least. In fact, I believe that we're never going to get to an artificial intelligence system. And if we are able to replicate intelligence ever, it's not going to be through technology. That's going to be through biotechnology, not artificial intelligence whatsoever. But I'm sure you've heard a lot of different quotes. Like, for example, Stephen Hawking saying, the development of full AI could spell the end of the human race. Or Elon Musk saying, with artificial intelligence, we're summoning the demon. And of course, I agree with them. In fact, I couldn't agree more. But you have to realize that none of them are using the word machine learning. They're all using the word artificial intelligence. And AI doesn't exist. It's not a thing. It's currently technologically impossible to create AI systems. The thought that we can actually replicate the human mind within a computer simply does not work out right now. Which is why AI won't replace us. AI won't replace you, no matter what you do. Whether you're in the field of healthcare or anything else, AI is not meant to replace you in most fields. It's meant to help you out. Machine learning technology will augment you and let you do more with the data that you're capturing every single day. In fact, I think it would be interesting to take a look at an example of how machine learning technology is being used. More specifically, in the field of physical security. And I'd like to take the example of the FBI in the US. Now, the FBI, of course, great agency, but powered by humans, of course, not powered by machine learning technology. Human FBI agents, though, well, they're limited to what humans can do. For example, they cannot sit around 24-7 looking at a certain camera feed and drawing lines and analyzing patterns of how people walk. That's simply impractical for any team of humans to be able to do 24-7 and at the end to be able to analyze all of the data that they gather. But machine learning systems are perfect for those kinds of repetitive tasks. Machine learning systems are built to sit there all day, every day, analyzing something and figuring out some kind of pattern to let us as humans know. And that's why the FBI uses cameras from a special company. The company is called Milestone Systems. I had a keynote for them a little while ago uh, at one of their conferences called, uh, uh, one of their Milestone Systems conferences in Las Vegas. And they actually shown a demo of one of their new intelligent cameras that they're working on. You see, Milestone Systems isn't just any surveillance company. They build intelligent cameras that have machine learning technology built into them. 
And what Milestone did is they created a camera that can actually track the location of certain people or cars or any other object in a video feed over time and analyze where people are walking or where objects are located. And what this acts as is essentially a 24-7 person tracker that's tracking people continuously, trying to figure out patterns in where exactly people are walking. And the FBI uses this in certain neighborhoods that they're actually very suspicious of. And in the end, you can actually tell that there's a very, very clear pattern of where people might be, for example, hiding or selling certain drugs because the FBI can easily see that in this empty neighborhood, there's this one spot that lots of people like to gather around, even if it's not at a certain time. All, overall, on average, this spot is very crowded compared to the surrounding neighborhood. They're able to easily detect that using machine learning technology. But again, machine learning can't act as an FBI agent. So, and so that's why human FBI agents need to use this machine learning technology to help them so that they can do their job in a more efficient way. And so that was a slightly more serious example of how machine learning can be used. Now though, let's take a look at a little bit more of a fun example of machine le learning being used. Probably something that you are using every day as well. And the example is in the field of product recommendation. Now, whether you realize it or not, product recommendation is something that impacts your life on a daily basis. It could be something like ordering a product on Amazon, watching a movie on Netflix or Hulu, or even nowadays opening up your iOS device and opening up an application, tell Siri what you like to open when, so that the next time you open up your lock screen, you can instantly be directed to that specific application. But product recommendation is a really, really interesting field. And I've worked on quite a few different product projects that actually use the power of machine learning in product recommendation. And there's one specific application that I'd love to demo today. But before I can get to that, there's one thing that I've got to cover first. And it might seem unrelated, but I'll talk about why it's related in just a second. Now, how do computers understand words? How do computers use machine learning to understand natural language? Well, the way they do that is through a special algorithm developed by Google. The inspiration for the algorithm came from a quote from 1951. The quote was from John Rupert Firth. He said, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. Meaning, you can understand what a word means based off of the words that come before and after that word. Google took this quote quite literally, and they actually developed an entire algorithm called word to vec that is, that is based off of understanding words based off of what comes immediately before and after those words. Essentially, the way the algorithm works is it uses a neural network to actually predict target words based off of the context words around them. And if you were to feed in, say, 300 million sentences, the neural network is able to learn not just the syntactics of language, not just how exactly things are written in terms of characters, but it understands the semantics of language. You can actually do arithmetic on words when you train a neural network like this one. You can do things like king minus man plus woman is equal to, and then the, the computer would reply, queen, because it's able to take the embeddings for all those different words and create a new semantic vector that represents that word. It's really interesting what this technology can do, but it's not just limited to words. You can understand practically any data based off of the company that it keeps which is a really interesting part. And I've applied this specific kind of algorithm to the field of music recommendation. In fact, not just any music recommendation, but the example that I'd like to show you today is an example of Apple. Now, of course, if you've seen Apple advertisements before, you know that they love to be creative uh, with how exactly they advertise their products. More specifically, even down to the music that they use to advertise their products, it's always different in every single advertisement. It's always different, it's a different kind of genre, different kind of style, but there's one thing in common between all the songs that Apple uses for their marketing. What's in common, what's in common is that Apple's marketing team approved the song. That's what you want to predict with the neural network. 
you want to predict, would the Apple marketing team approve this song to go into an advertisement? You're not trying to find similar songs. You're not trying to find things that sound similar acoustically. You're trying to figure out whether or not a certain song would go through the approval of the Apple marketing team. And so that's what I did. I trained a neural network on around 300,000 uh, user history of, of, of music playing from the last.fm uh, music streaming service. And then I took a bunch of different songs from Apple advertisements and I actually went ahead and fed them into my neural network. And I essentially asked my neural network to predict another song that Apple might use for one of their product reveals. Now, the songs that you see on screen right now are songs that Apple has used previously in their advertisements. And just to give you a quick idea of what exactly these sound like and how different they are and how different they sound, I'd love to play just a really quick clip of each song for you to give you an idea of what they are. And then after that, I'll tell you what my neural network predicted that Apple should use for their next product reveal. I'm a new soul, I came to this strange world Hoping I could learn a bit about how to give and take give you an idea, all of, those sounds, all of those songs sound completely different. None of them, or almost none of them, have anything in common with each other in terms of the way they sound. But what, again, is in common between all of them is that the Apple marketing team proved them. So I fed these songs into the neural network, gave it a little bit of time to analyze them, and within 10 seconds it came back to me and said that this is the song that most fits the kind of personality of the Apple marketing team. And I'd love to play, I'd love to play a quick sample of this song for you as well. So again, it sounds completely different from what all of the other songs that I fed in sounded like. But the really interesting part is that just a few weeks after I predicted this song, Apple actually went ahead and implemented a song very similar to this one for their iMac Pro product reveal, which kind of proves that the neural network was able to predict what exactly the taste of the Apple marketing team is in order to provide new songs that fit that general category while even though not sounding anything like the others. And so that's just how machine learning works. And that's just another quick example of how we're all using machine learning technology. Even down to the way that Netflix represents those movies for you is determined with machine learning technology. If there's a certain genre of movie that you like, and there's a movie that covers numerous genres, including the one that you like, then Netflix will show you a movie poster that specifically is tailored towards your interests to try and get you to watch the movie. All of that is powered by machine learning technology and the huge user base and data that Netflix has. And Amazon gets really intricate with their product recommendations. 
They actually have an open source library called Destiny that they use to recommend not only categories of products, but down to the very specific model of a product that you would be interested in or that you might want to buy based off of the products that you've already bought. This technology is letting us all live a more efficient life with the technology that we use. But as I mentioned, out of all the different fields that this technology impacts, out of the physical security that I've just shown you, the entertainment, product recommendation, marketing, there is one field that I'm most passionate about, and that is the field of healthcare. Because machine learning is perfect for healthcare, and healthcare is perfect for machine learning as well. There is so much data in this field, and there are so many companies willing to implement the power of machine learning technology in this field as well. And what's happening is we need this machine learning technology because there's a lack of humans. There simply aren't enough humans to scale up this extremely important field. And so we need machine learning technology to help us as much as we can. As a quick example, let's take a look at an initiative from IBM Research in Australia and New Zealand. Now, in Australia and New Zealand, melanoma, a kind of skin cancer, is a huge problem. Every six hours, one person dies from melanoma. That is a huge number. But then again, melanoma is one of the deadliest skin cancers, but also one of the easiest to treat. In fact, if melanoma is caught early enough, you have more than a 98% chance of surviving. There's almost no way that you will not survive if it's caught early enough. The problem, though, is that melanoma appears in the form of skin lesions. And these skin lesions could lead to numerous different outcomes. And any professional oncologist with the unaided eye has a 60% chance of accurately diagnosing melanoma in a skin lesion. Any oncologist with the proper machinery and tools can do so around 81 to 82% of the time. But when an oncologist uses machine learning, more specifically IBM Watson, to help them out, they're able to diagnose melanoma accurately more than 91% of the time. Imagine how many people's lives could be saved. Every six hours, that person that was going to die from melanoma, their life could be saved because now machine learning can help doctors to actually predict when melanoma is going to strike at a much earlier stage than ever possible before. As I mentioned, I'm working on numerous different projects in this field of healthcare, but the one that I'd like to share with you today is a project of mine called Project Cognitive. And the project is a collaboration between me and my mentor, Timothy Duncan. The entire point of the project is essentially to provide an artificial communication ability to those who cannot communicate naturally. And the way it works is by understanding their EEG brainwaves. Now, the inspiration to start this project came from helping out Boo. Boo is a quadriplegic girl that lives just north of Toronto and suffers from Rett syndrome, meaning that she's unable to communicate in any way whatsoever. But what I'm doing is working on custom machine learning algorithms that enable me to understand those electroencephalogram brainwaves in order to actually go ahead and predict small patterns in her EEG that could hint towards her trying to communicate simple intents like yes, no, not sure, or maybe, and then use those EEG brainwaves in order to provide her a kind of artificial communication ability. And to train these machine learning algorithms, I'll be taking the help of Boo's mom. You see, Boo's mom can understand the very broad concepts that Boo tries to convey, even though no one else can. Which is why we've given her the title of the intimate interpreter. And with her help, we're going to be live labeling the training data as we gather it from the headset in order to train my machine learning systems to understand Boo. And because it's based off of machine learning, it's very scalable and flexible. It really does not matter how someone has lost their natural communication ability, a certain disease, a certain accident. As long as I can gather accurate electroencephalogram data from them, I should be able to go ahead and train a machine learning algorithm to try and understand that EEG and provide them back that communication ability. But Finally, those were just a few of my projects that used the power of machine learning. I've shown you an example of the FBI using machine learning for physical security and how I'm using machine learning 
for product recommendation, and now in the field of healthcare to provide artificial communication as well. But before I end off today, there is, again, a, this misconception that I'd like to clear. It's a misconception, of course, that a lot of people have. But as I've said, we shouldn't be afraid of machine learning technology. AI is not meant to replace us. AI isn't a thing. Artificial intelligence doesn't exist because you cannot simulate human intelligence in a computer. We shouldn't be afraid of machine learning because it's going to help us out and enable us to do more than we ever could have done before with the technology that already surrounds us in our everyday lives. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining in today. That's what I have for my keynote. Thank you. If you'd like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you'd like to contact me, please do feel free to do so on any of the following social media. I'd love to get in touch, and I do believe we have a Q&A session now. So any questions you have, I'd love to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. If you have any questions, just go ahead and raise your hand, and I'd love to answer them. And we'll get a microphone to you. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. Sir, you have achieved such. Sir, you have achieved so many things at such a young age. What is the contribution of your parents towards your success? Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you, actually. So thank you for the question. So, I mean, of course, as I mentioned, originally when I was five years old, the entire reason that I got into programming in the first place was not just because I was curious about technology, but because my dad was able to see the curiosity that I had for machine learning, or not for machine learning, for programming and for computers in general. Uh, and so really what I believe is that, first of all, if my parents had never seen that sort of passion that I have, that curiosity that I have, then of course I would never be using technology in the first place. But from there, the fact that they were able to see it and go ahead and nurture that sort of passion that I had, uh, you know, providing all the resources that I need, providing me with all the different learning resources, for example, that I would need, uh, and allowing me to go ahead and use that technology uh, is really, really important. In fact, I'm also homeschooled uh, since around grade six, allowing me to really focus on the areas that I'm really passionate about. And so my dad actually works as a teacher now as well, tutor. Uh, and so it becomes a lot simpler because he has all the sort of uh, resources and everything. So uh, yes, they do help me out a lot in the sort of critical uh, to what I've been doing, them being able to find and nurture that passion that I had and now provide with all the resources uh, was really, really important. Um, and of course, without that, I wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be here in India today. Uh, hello, Tanmay. I am Arunav. Uh, where are you? Sorry, uh, I can't see. Oh, there. Perfect. Uh, Thanks. Uh, what, uh, what are your views on quantum computing and how will it affect the uh, big data and all of that industry? Sure. So quantum computing is really, really interesting. But the thing is, quantum computing is really new as well. This is like when computers were first invented and we had those huge rooms full of computers that could do what our phone can do now. Uh, just like, for example, the same computer that was in the Apollo missions that was bringing people to the moon. Our phones are now a thousand times more computationally powerful than those computers. So what I will say is that quantum computing itself is in similarly a very, very early stage. It's still yet to be seen how exactly we will be able to use it in numerous different fields like machine learning, but there are definitely lots of different possibilities because quantum computing can store much more data than you could with a regular computer because of some you know, certain uh, fundamental properties of quantum physics like superposition, entanglement, that let you store a lot more information in a lot less space than you could do with classical computing. So it's really, really interesting technology. The possibilities are endless, but it's going to be really, really difficult to bring developers into it because quantum physics is really, really weird. Um, in order to understand how to do quantum computing, you basically have to throw away all the stuff that you know about classical computing and understand quantum from absolute scratch, from the very ground up. Uh, and so doing that, uh, providing the developers with the resources for that is going to be important, and seeing how different companies uh, actually provide quantum computing as a service. Uh, like if you take a look, IBM is actually the first to actually provide quantum computing in the cloud. 
You can actually go to the IBM Q experience and use a real quantum computer right now if you wanted to. Of course, they're not as complex as what, of course, they will be in the future, but they are there. You can get up to a 20 qubit machine, uh, quantum bit machine, uh, and actually start experimenting with it today. So the possibilities are huge, but it's still yet to be seen where it could be implemented in a practical way. Thank you. So. Yes. Yes. How can you achieve this position with your study in the youngest age? <laughs> sure. So what happened was, I mean, as I mentioned, when I was around five is when I started programming originally. And when I was five, I wasn't really programming for the sake of programming. But I mean, as a five-year-old, I didn't even know what a job really was. I didn't know people were paid for co to code. I used to just think that coding or computers in general, really, were just another thing that people would you know, play with at, the, at that point. And so I started programming really mainly as something that I would do for fun. But then eventually, uh, that turned sort of, I guess you could say, more serious when I stumbled upon things like iOS development, uh, when I started creating my YouTube channel, uh, YouTube tutorials, uh, and also when I started stumbled upon machine learning, I got even more in depth with it. But even right now, machine, uh, the sort of programming is something that I just do as a hobby. Um, and of course, I'm able to balance it with all the stuff that I study uh, because I'm homeschooled as well. Uh, so that does help um, with all the different resources that I'm able to get. I can sort of, you know, uh, accelerate and take a look at another grades curriculum if I want to. I can stay in my current grade. I can do whatever I want to there. So homeschooling does help out with, help out with that. Um, and also the fact that I don't really program as a job, really. It's more of just something that I love to do. That's a hobby, you could say. Thank you. Um, yes. How did you start with machine learning? And uh, what level of math is required, according to you, to st get started with machine learning? Sure. So to get started with machine learning uh, from absolute scratch, not needing to actually you know, code in custom implementations of it, you actually do not need much background in math. If you're using a service like IBM Watson, sort of the whole point of that is that you do not need to implement machine learning technology from scratch. If you're using something like IBM Watson, or if you're using something like uh, the if you're using something like the Watson Studio, or if you're using TensorFlow or Keras, another one of those deep learning libraries that are pre-built, you don't need nearly as much of a background in math as you would if you were to actually start machine learning from scratch, from the ground up. If you were to actually start building out machine learning um, yourself with a custom implementation of it, then you need to understand a little bit of sort of calculus that goes behind algorithms like gradient descent and backpropagation. But really, once you start to get into it, it's not as complex as it sounds from the outside. And how I got into machine learning was, I mean, as I mentioned, I stumbled upon that documentary of IBM Watson. And Watson uh, actually has these tools that you can use online as a developer and incorporate machine learning in your apps in a really simple way. And so Watson was what I originally started off with. It's a really simple way to get into machine learning technology. So that's how I started. Uh, and from there, I sort of grew in terms of uh, complexity. Uh, I started to use custom neural networks around six or seven months after I stumbled upon IBM Watson. Um, and so really, the way that I practiced those, those neural networks and the algorithms that went behind them is by actually drawing out a neural network on paper and running the mathematical operations for, uh, for backpropagation on paper as well. Uh, which does sound very repetitive, and it is, but it's worth to do it a few times just to get sort of the hang of it. So I would do that, I would practice that, and eventually start using more high-level APIs like TensorFlow or Keras, because as a real sort of machine learning engineer, I guess, or architect, you will never need to implement custom neural networks and machine learning algorithms, or at least almost never. You will almost always be using a third-party API or library like TensorFlow or Keras or Watson. Um, so understanding the sort of math behind it is not completely necessary, but it does definitely help out when you're designing the architecture for it. Thank you. Hi, Tanmay. Yes, where are you? Uh, yes. Can you please share your experience with Google? Sure. So um, that, so ar around Google. Uh, it's pretty interesting what happens there. So what, what, what happened was someone actually took a little clip of an interview that I had, and they, they took a little, a little portion of it. And they put a little caption under it that I work for Google. And they actually published it to YouTube. And around 2 million people now think that I work for Google. But rest assured, I don't work for Google. Um, I'm not paid by Google, or IBM for that matter. Um, rather, I have used their services. I have definitely used Google Cloud, Amazon Cloud, IBM Cloud. They have great services, like for example, TensorFlow. They've got a great sort of uh, machine learning workflow environment. You know, Google has these new things called tensor processing units, which are all around basically processing tensor operations, uh, which would be basically the operations that go behind neural networks. 
Uh, however, uh, I have not been you know too in depth with using every single one of their services. I will do. I will say that they have great technology, um, but no, I don't actually work for them or have experience inside of Google as a company. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Uh, yeah. hey. Excuse me. Hello. Hello. Um, what I'm getting an idea is that machine learning has endless possibilities, right? So what if uh, it could be used for malicious purposes or even criminal activities? So shouldn't we then be afraid of machine learning? What do you think? Sure. So it was just so I understand your question. So you're saying machine learning being used for malicious purposes? Uh, it could, could it be used if yeah, it sure. has endless possibilities? Yeah. Sure. Yes, definitely. Machine learning can absolutely be used for malicious purposes. In fact, it will be used for malicious. It has been used for malicious purposes in the past. And even very recently, it has been used for very malicious purposes as well. But there's one thing you have to realize. So with everything that humans develop, it could be something as simple as fire, something as complex as machine learning. It will be used for bad things. Like when, when humans discovered fire, for example, you could go ahead and burn someone's house down, or you could cook food with fire. There's a negative and positive to everything, but you've got to realize that that technology itself lets us go ahead and sort of fend off the of people who are using it for negative purposes. Like you could use fire to chase down the people who are burning people's houses down. So that's just a quick analogy. But machine learning, of course, a lot of people say that because it's more powerful, it could do more bad than it could do good. Good, and we wouldn't be able to counter it. But what I believe is that you know a lot of people call for regulation of machine learning, that we shouldn't implement machine learning. But that's actually the exact opposite of what we should be doing. We should be doubling down on implementing machine learning so that we understand how to use it completely, because there's no way you can prevent people from using it. Right. If, if you prevent people from using it, they're going to figure out a way to do it themselves and then only use it for malicious purposes. Whereas if it's supported by the community, it'll be used for positive and negative purposes. Like for example, if you take a look a little while ago, uh, there is a startup in Montreal that actually uses neural networks to create fake audio of people speaking. And so you can feed in, for example, and actually what they did is they fed in a bunch of speeches uh, from Barack Obama and from Donald Trump and they uh -huh. fed them into uh, the, the service and they were able to create new videos of them speaking in their voice but whatever they want them to say. Um, and so, yes, it'll be used for malicious purposes, but then again, DARPA from the US was able to use machine learning to detect subtle cues in those videos or in the audio and that, that could actually determine whether or not it's fake or real. So there's definitely positive and negative to everything, but then there's also going to be the technology that helps us counter the people who are using it for negative purposes. Um, so where do you think uh, machine learning is at now? Is the advantages outweighing the disadvantages? So currently, machine learning is at a really interesting stage because a lot of people are starting to implement it. There haven't been too many malicious implementations of machine learning yet, although the algorithms exist. And in theory, if someone were determined enough to use it for a malicious purpose, they absolutely could. But the technology to counter that also scale? exists. Sorry? On a very large scale? Uh, sorry, I didn't get that. On a very large scale? Yeah, yeah, on definitely a very large scale. Oh, okay. uh, but we also have the technology to counter that on a large scale as well. Uh, that does oh. exist. Uh, but one thing I will say is that there are also more challenges that machine learning faces apart from the malicious activity that's possible. Uh, like, for example, a black box problem. Uh, there are certain facial recognition systems, like, for example, uh, Microsoft and Samsung, a few different companies have facial recognition systems uh, that break down, or not necessarily break down, but are more accurate towards certain demographics and less accurate towards certain demographics. So working towards understanding why neural networks make the decisions that they make, how exactly they're coming to a conclusion, that is really important to make sure that there's no, for example, right. human bias in the data. And so there are definitely some challenges that it faces. There are some purposes that are malicious that it could be used for. But I would say that currently the advantages heavily outweigh the disadvantages. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Tanmay. Yes. My question is, what's your take on optimization problems? Uh, on optimization problems. So it uh, really depends on what you mean by that. Uh, in terms of optimization problems for, I'll give you an example, say, a vacation, let's Google. say to Sorry? Mexico, a vacation to New Mexico City. So what's the best Sorry, way I, to I, I couldn't get a that. A vacation to a place. So how do you optimize the most efficient route? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. This actually gives me a really good example. There's actually a trucking company in India that uses this technology for optimization. 
So there was another example I was going to give around Google, but I'll give that to you in a second. First of all, let's talk about Rivago. So Rivago is a tracking company you've probably heard of in India. They've actually cut down the time to go from, I forget which city, but you can Google up their website, and from one in India to one, from two weeks, they've been able to cut that down to one week, half the time. So what they do is they use machine learning technology and really technology in every step of the pipeline to optimize the route that the drivers take. They optimize the way that the drivers switch inside of the truck. They optimize which drivers will be used for certain two routes. They're able to optimize all of that using genetic algorithms and using machine learning. And so that is definitely a very, very interesting problem. It's one that still needs to be researched a bit more to figure out how exactly machine learning could be used. Because like for example, right now, UPS, uh, they have hubs all across the world. They have uh, sort of a main hub in Anchorage. They have a main hub in Louisville. And Louisville is the main population center of the US, so that's a great place to put one. But there is a problem. Uh, let's just say that there's a low demand destination somewhere in California. Uh, in order for them to get their package, it would have to go from, say, China to Anchorage to Louisville to Seattle and then to California instead of directly to California. But that's just based off of human analytics and statistics. So there are companies that are working on using machine learning to optimize, uh, for example, which routes UPS planes should take. Another thing that you've probably realized is that, for example, um, truck, not necessarily trucking companies, but logistics companies like UPS and FedEx and, 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 and other companies like that, DHL, they do not usually use things like the latest planes. And the reason they don't use the latest planes, they always use really, really old planes, is because their planes are on the ground most of the time. Airlines, though, passenger airlines, are always putting them in the sky. They're always using them continuously. And so they need the newest planes and because they're worth it. They're always in the sky. They're never just sitting. So you could use machine learning to optimize the usage of all of your aircraft through different routes and make sure that you're always flying the best way possible, the most efficient way possible, using their, your fleet the best way it can be used. So definitely machine learning can be very useful there. There are some companies that have already started implementing it, um, but it's still to be seen uh, how more major companies like UPS and FedEx will go ahead and use that. OK, I have another one that is, yes. that what's the best way to find how a machine, like a code, came to a conclusion in artificial intelligence or uh, sorry, machine didn't... learning code? I think a new, Like a neural network, Yeah. how did it come to a conclusion? Yes, OK. That's, again, one of the major problems with machine learning technology. So it's called a black box problem. And there are also some variants of it, like the bias problem, but mainly the black box problem. So uh, the, the, the sort of premise of the problem is that neural networks are really acting like black boxes. We can't understand why they make the decision that they make. Like, for example, uh, banks have neural networks that are able to take in a bunch of different variables, like where someone lives, how much they earn, which company they work for, all that kind of things, all those kind of things, uh, and kind of predict um, whether or not they'll be, able to, they'll be able to pay off a loan. Now, the thing is, how do you make sure that the neural network isn't biasing off of something that it shouldn't bias off of in order to make the decision? There are a few different ways. There's the attention mechanism, which is the most widely used algorithm, which essentially says, all right, take every input to the neural network and apply something called a softmax layer to it. Softmax is basically an activation function that converts every input into a scale of 0 to 1, and the sum of all those inputs will then be a 1. So it's basically a probability distribution. Um, and then take that probability distribution and multiply each input by that probability distribution, then feed that through the neural network. At the end, you have two outputs, the attention values and the output of the neural network. The attention values tell you the importance of each variable, and the output would tell you what the neural network says. But that's kind of a workaround to the actual problem. That's not a real way to solve it. Uh, the real way to solve it would be to understand what each weight means and what each weight would connect to in terms of importance towards a certain weight. Um, there are some algorithms that can do that, like uh, gradient-based class activation maps for convolutional neural networks. Um, but it really depends on which algorithm you're using, what you're using it for, uh, and there's still many challenges around that. There are definitely some people working towards solving the problem, but so far, it's not a solved problem. Third and the last one, that is? Oh, no problem. Okay. This will be, we'll be taking one last yeah, question. Just please, please. The third one is that uh, when you're asking a network to recognize a shoe, yes. so mostly humans feed the data, so how do you avoid that human bias coming into the data? Feeding so, so, sorry, you're saying uh, how exactly do you feed in that data into the neural network? Uh, and, and there is no bias that humans, like yes. somebody likes this shoe and provides more of that shoe. Yes. So that's the whole problem with the, there's actually another problem around machine learning called the bias problem. 
So uh, this is what I was just mentioning, like certain facial recognition systems. Even if you were to take a look, uh, I'll get to the shoe example in a moment, but like facial recognition systems. Um, sometimes they're better at recognizing the faces of certain demographics of people uh, over than certain demographics, and that's because humans are the one that label the data. And humans have innate bias that trickles into the data. There's no way you can prevent it. It's bias that you as a human do not realize you have sometimes. Some people might realize it, some people might see it in some people, but there's always that instinctual sort of genetic bias that you don't realize that you have that trickles into the data that you label and then feed into a neural network. And so what happens is, and the reason that it's a hard problem to solve is that neural networks work off of bias. They work by biasing certain kinds of inputs to certain kinds of outputs. But when they're trained on data that has a kind of human bias that we don't want, there's no way to really detect that in the weights of the neural network and there's no way to remove from the data. The only way that I see that's practical to solve the problem is to completely crack the black box problem and then move to the bias problem. So either we scrub our data and free it of all bias, or we go ahead and scrub our neural networks. Scrubbing the neural networks will probably be harder but more practical. Scrubbing the data is going to be easier but less practical. So really depends on you know, who's working on it, who has the sort of application to do so. Um, but overall, it's a problem that we're still working on solving. Um, thank you, sir. I'm, I'm sorry. We have, to start wi we, have, we have to start winding up now. So no, we, we, we can't take any more questions now. Sorry. OK, last one. Last yeah. one. Uh, what do you intend to do in the future? Basically, what's your future plan? Sure. Thank you. So mainly for the future, uh, what I plan on doing, I mean, of course, working with machine learning technology is what I'm interested in. Uh, but implementing machine learning technology specifically in the field of healthcare is what I love. Uh, and so I'm currently working on numerous different projects, including a new one in a new field uh, that we'll be hearing more about towards the end of the year. Um, but basically, implementing machine learning in healthcare is what I'm most passionate about. And also, making machine learning technology accessible to more developers is what I'm interested in. Uh, because again, as I mentioned, machine learning technology is great, but it has a very steep learning curve, and it's hard to get started. <clears throat> and so essentially making more open source machine learning frameworks and environments is important so that more developers can use and leverage that technology in their applications. Like, and just to show you sort of the impact that that has, for example, last last year, um, Apple introduced this new library called CoreML that lets developers incorporate machine learning into their iOS applications really easily. And ever since then, there has been a spike in the number of applications that use machine learning. And the more apps that use it, the better, because more data collected, better machine learning models, and better experiences for the users. So definitely, machine learning in healthcare, making it accessible to more developers, and getting more people into programming in the first place, and really spreading awareness about what AI is and what AI isn't, just to clear up the biases that a lot of people have about it. That's sort of the main stuff that I'm interested in. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Tanmay. Thank you. Last person from this side. Uh, Dear Tanmay, please. We, we, uh, first of we all, we start I with the felicitation ceremony. We can't have any more questions. Last person, please. Only two minutes. Is it okay or not? Yes or no? Okay. Yeah, okay. One last. Yeah. Thank please, you. Please, uh, I request everybody. We have to start with the felicitation ceremony. Please. Yeah. First of all, I would like to congratulate for your so wonderful, informative, and motivational talk. Thank you. We know that you achieved a lot in your so early years, which is very hard to earn by any other person Thank you. in whole life. So I want to know that according to you, what is the success mantra of your life? <laughs> sure. So, I mean, there are quite a few things. Um, what, if you're asking sort of like, um, how you can find something that you're passionate about, or how to, I wouldn't necessarily say success or, or succeeding, but what I would say is that I'm really just doing what I'm passionate about, right? I love technology, I love working with uh, programming and technology in general, and, and that's what I'm currently working with. And so I always tell people that really you should be doing what you're passionate about. You should always sort of be following your passion, following your heart, whatever it may be. It might be programming, it might be art, it might be math or science, whatever else it is. Make sure that you're doing, first of all, what you're passionate about is very, very important, but also make sure that you're really perseverant. Um, and perseverance is, of course, applicable everywhere, especially, I'd say, in programming, though. Uh, programming itself is all about trying new methods, 
uh, and creating new architectures and algorithms and fixing the problem inside of those architectures uh, until you find something that works. Uh, and so I would say that definitely that being passionate about what you're doing, being perseverant, and learning based off of example is also really, really important. Uh, like for example, when you're learning, again, example is programming, but this could be anything. Um, when I'm learning programming, I don't just follow the curriculum. I go ahead and implement my own applications, create my own examples, uh, and do all of that in order to learn and actually get a, a better understanding of what exactly I'm doing uh, and how exactly it works. So those are sort of the basic three uh, sort of, I guess you could say, tips that I have or what I did. Um, but really it depends on, on what you're doing and, and in which field you're passionate about. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're privileged to have with us today Padmashi G.C. Jain, founder chairman of BBB Publications. We'd like to honor him with a small souvenir. I request Dr. S.K. Khadri to felicitate uh, Mr. Tanmay Bakshi's parents and grandfather. I now request Jyoti Aurora ma'am to felicitate Mr. Tanmay Bakshi. I uh, once again uh, request to felicitate the parents of uh, Tanmay Bakshi by Dr. G.C. Jain. Um, 
as we now come towards the end of this program on behalf of all amity group of schools we extend our deepest gratitude to chairperson ma'am whose blessings are always with us in every minute of our existence